welcome to Galaxy Brains. The weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. Yo, I mean to be first on the scene when I burst. To mean my team and your curse. I'm never feeling compelled. Never seen this man sell. And I know that Dan held all that when I talk smack on the mic daily. Fall back when I rock tracks every night, baby. Cause I'm erudite. Maybe you stuck in the trial like Sisyphus. I'm flipping the script, turning dials like Phineas. Yo, I'm flipping coins and slipping different pools. Dripping, clipping pools. Blocks tick simple rules. Y'all wanna be best, but you only PSPT. You're half of what you need to send it like me, you see? Inscrutable, unstoppable, unseizable, immutable. Can't mute the bull when he start that beautiful. Dutiful golden run the coins shine like golden sun you better be holding some before the show is done as always i'm your host alex thorne head of firmwide research at galaxy digital thank you for listening to galaxy brains we have a great show for you today dan held is our guest uh he's a bitcoin og currently uh works with taproot wizards and trust machines uh, formerly of Kraken and many other projects. It's a great interview you won't want to miss. And of course, we'll check in with our friend, Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading, as always, to talk about markets and macro. But before we get into all of that, I need to remind you to please refer to the link to the disclaimer in the podcast notes and note that none of the information contained in this podcast represents investment advice or an offer recommendation or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. We've got a great show. Let's get right into it. Let's go now to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading. As always, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Great to have you as always. Big day today, Fed Day. It's the Super Bowl. It's your Super Bowl. Absolutely. What happened? Uh, so the Fed raised rates today uh, by 25 basis points, taking the ban for the Fed funds rate from uh, you know 475 to five to five and five and a quarter. Uh, that was pretty much expected. We had 22 basis points of 25 priced in um so this really came as as you know uh, it, it came as no surprise to anyone um in addition uh, we had the release of, of the fomc statement and we also had the press conference um i would say that the message from from powell and the statement was broadly neutral it did not shock the market in any way and you can see that um by the lack of sort of major moves in, in fixed income and in traditional markets um i think the most notable sort of parts of it were um his comments surrounding su- surrounding the banks and the regional banks in in particular um he had a statement in there that that said that you know he thinks the the bank situation has actually eased um you know from february to to, to march recently even though we've just had the, the first right. republic issue uh, the one thing i'd like to note uh, for our audience is that the fed actually has the most advanced uh, banking data available to it, and that is ahead of the market. They actually have uh, the loan survey uh, data um, already. In addition, uh, what we've been told is that their staffers have been communicating with a bunch of bank um, executives over the past couple of weeks, so they are getting real-time sort of assessment of, of the banking situation amongst regionals. And so um, while I think that there's been a lot of sensationalism amongst the, the media um, and hype, I do agree with him that largely uh, the, the bulk of the, the banking issues are from, you know, First Republic, Silicon Valley, Signature, et cetera, and that the rest of the, the banking system or, or the banking issues are going to be more drawn out as you sort of have the competition for, for deposits, et cetera, and they're not going to be like a bank is going to get, right. you know, run in like, you know, a day. Um, and so, I, so I the think, more acute threats to those regional banks we think have passed. I, I, There's still I, I, big I lingering so. issues. Yeah. But, but but what he had to acknowledge simultaneously was that the data is still really robust, right? Just today alone, we had ADP, uh, 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 it's a payroll survey, um, at 300,000 jobs uh, in the United States. That's not non-farm payrolls. That's on Friday. Yeah. But ADP, uh, which is you know, good enough, is telling you that you're not – only adding jobs, but you're adding jobs like at a really robust rate, <laughs> as if you hadn't hiked by 500 basis points already, um, which is wild. And then you look at the service sector of the economy, which is really important because the Fed's focused on services inflation, right? ISM services came out today, surprised it a little bit higher. Prices paid for services, surprised higher. New orders for services, surprised higher. Right. And you had the PMI for services come in in expansionary ter- territory once again. And you also have global PMIs that have start- are starting to-, to shift higher. And so the-, the data with respect to prices and service prices is telling you that you could probably still continue to hike. Yeah. Um, 
and the unemployment market, he said so in the speech today, it, unemployment is at a 50-year low. 50-year <laughs> low. Wow. And so, you know, yes, we do have the, these banking issues. And, you know, we've had three large banks fail under his watch. And, re, like, uh, any reasonable person can get to the conclusion that there wasn't uh, sufficient supervision and that uh, hiking rates too quickly and too high was probably um, a mistake. Um, or not doing it sooner or making Whatever. it more gradual, right. et cetera. Right? There were mistakes made, but it does not change the data backdrop. And I think the moment you get through this banking crisis stuff, people will settle and realize, what are we in? We're in a world where the U.S. economy is still adding hundreds of thousands of jobs per month. And without that labor unemployment starting to tick up, it's going to be very tough for inflation to come down. And And I think... You know, certain folks, you know, draw comfort from the idea that inflation break evens in twos, fives and tens, you know, they're basically at two percent right now. What I'd like to remind people and what I constantly say is that every single smart person is basically awful at predicting inflation. They have been for decades. They're every central banker, every trader, et cetera, for the most part. Like, I don't know anyone that has been consistently right on inflation. And so, you know, when you see the market telling you you're going to get to 2% inflation, I'll be like, no, no way. Like, that could I be completely wrong. wrong. It, it could be, be yeah. completely it's likely wrong. to be wrong. Yeah. And it's just, just a function of, like, just habits and, like, things that have changed over time. Like, you're telling me that, you know, when you start going to the doctor and you're paying $100 a month and they're raising it $10 every year, they're going to stop raising it at some point? Like, the, that momentum has already started, Yeah. right? And I, I think, again, it goes back to, like, the difference between Western folks and EM folks, right? EM folks have seen the ba- the fight, you know, against inflation. It just doesn't go away. It and becomes entrenched, especially when you're talking about a labor market that's at a 50 year. People have good jobs, and they and so I mean, even today. So again, it's Wednesday, what May third? Um, Correct. And um, which is why it was Fed Day. And no, I mean, even today, I'm watching people buying. Uh, it costs sixteen dollars here where we work, not in our building, but like at the place nearby, for three slices of pizza. Absolutely. $16. It's more than $5 per slice of pizza. And the line was out the door. <laughs> out the door. People are willing to pay that. And so, like, it's, 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 um, now this is, you know, lower Manhattan. It's a, you know, a business area. Like, there's plenty of cheaper pizza in New York than that. But I mean, like, that line is no one's being like, oh my God, I can't eat this today. Honestly, I'm going to go to, go a to any place. airport. I mean, yeah. restaurants, et cetera. They're all pretty expensive. Everything's expensive. And here's like, the thing. if we want inflation to mm-hmm. come down, everyone needs to collectively throw their hands up and say, this is too expensive. But more of them are employed than ever, right? Like, there's people don't feel they have to collectively. Well, here's the thing. Their unemployment's low, but there's also huge social safety net programs, right? The, the student loan payments that were paused, the foreclosures that, that were paused as well. And then you just have this excess savings build from the stimulus checks, right. the PPP loans, et cetera. Like you're still talking about like over a trillion dollars in excess savings in the I US. saw that. I saw that chart still. Still. Even still. Oh, let, let's talk about the 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 debt of the United oh States of America. Oh my God! Don't even get me started. So we have I, a lot of it. What do we have? Over thirty-one trillion dollars of thirty-two of debt. plus trillion. I'd guess right. thirty-three. I yeah. lift the over on thirty-two. It's a, a lot. It's a lot of debt. Gosh, darn, that's a lot of debt. You got a credit card. It's Dude, loaded I, up. Just try counting to a billion. But we're and then counting our, to a trillion. We've basically <laughs> hit our credit limit. Yes. Right. Amex is saying, whoa, 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 oh, whoa, yeah. But. We have this ace in our sleeve. We can actually, it turns out we're on the board of of the credit card company. And we can say, you know what? Raise our limit. And that's what we've been doing now for decades. Yes. <laughs> and we have to do it now because we have exceeded the limit or hit the limit. Uh, we've talked about this. The Treasury is currently using extraordinary measures to fund mm-hmm. the government. These are um, payments that we've already committed to, right? So it's Correct. not new spending. And we had thought that. For a while, it had been said that we could last to July, maybe even to August. Correct. Before a limit, the debt ceiling limit had to be raised. Now, the you know, there's negotiations. The House managed to pass something. Speaker McCarthy rallied. Um, it has other stuff. I think the Democrats were calling it like a, oh gosh, like a right wing ransom note. I think is what one of the Senate yeah. Democratic leaders said. They're jostling now. The Secretary of the Treasury, who is all you know, Janet Yellen, who who is the administration's chief economic spokesperson. 
She has now said it may hit the debt ceiling by June first. That's less than a month away. Correct. Um, there's some posturing there, but w- you know what are we like? How important? <laughs> it's very important it's that this gets solved. It's right? insanely important that the U.S. government does not default on its debt. It is the backbone of global finance. Is is the U.S. debt market? Right. And so it would be a pretty big deal. Um, most people have no idea what the actual implications are in terms of like how wild things could possibly get. You mean the average person or smart people or smart, everyone? Everyone. Yeah. Uh, I, I, no one knows. It could be no, it, economic apocalypse. Or it could be like people have rushed to buy the bonds because it's a flight to quality. Like, I don't know. Because we could Does default the and then sell off? It. Does it go bid? No one right? knows. Like, who knows? Volatility and, is the only thing we can uh, be certain of. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, which will bring me to a different point uh, okay. la- later on. Uh, but I think what you have um, is a setup that is really constructive for Republicans, I think. I think if you're an incumbent president, right, uh, you've, that is running for re-election, you've got a lot more to lose than the congressional, you know, Republicans and Senate Republicans, et cetera. Because in the election, right, who ultimately is going to get the blame for not raising right, the debt ceiling? If this goes wrong, if this goes blame wrong the, the president. And the, the, you blame the, the president, yeah, right? And I think he's got a lot more to lose. And so I do genuinely think that Republicans will come out with something tangible. Some kind of like a moratorium cap on future spending, and et cetera. Whatever it may be. Right. And the other thing I know that I think for sure is that it will go down to the wire. Right. You will get more bang for your buck in terms of negotiating when it's, you know, like imagine it's like you're doing that two car thing. Hey, right. Uh, like game of chicken. Game of chicken. Right. And it's it's going to be the, the first person who flinches will lose. And right. so ultimately, I think it's going to come down to the wire just because I think that's how the game theory works. Yeah. Um, and I do think the Republicans will, will kind of win. But on the off chance that the U.S. government does default. This is literally one of my favorite reasons to own Bitcoin ever is the U.S. government potentially defaulting because of a government that does not work. Again, friendly reminder, this is the same Congress that took 16 attempts to elect McCarthy for uh, House <laughs> for Speaker. For yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Right. And so this is a divided Congress and um, let alone within their own parties, but, you know, amongst each other as well. Um, and the idea that the most important like institution, government in the world is about to default, and it, it's mostly over fun- political bickering too. Political not even bickering, they're not making a determination that we shouldn't raise the debt limit. No, they just absolutely. Are fighting but about it. people will yeah. fundamentally start doubting the idea of money and U.S. Treasuries and what that means. And I think that's going to be so incredibly constructive for Bitcoin. I think the number one trade to have as a hedge, as a hedge um, for a government default, is owning Bitcoin calls. Yeah. I, I think Bitcoin could trade, um, you know, north of this year's highs in like probably closer to 40K on the chance of a genuine government default. Right. And so given how cheap those wings are, especially short dated stuff, I think owning Bitcoin like wingy upside is probably one of the best diversification like government default hedges you can possibly have yeah. um, in a portfolio. And I think it's almost... Like if you were managing hundreds of billions in a in a cross asset portfolio, you're a big insurance company, you're a big real money account, and you're in crazy amount of treasuries, right? What are you? The CDS market for U.S. B- barely exists, right? You got to trade with a non-U.S. bank, and it's weird. You might not get your payoffs. Like the best hedge for that, I think, the best convexity in the market um, is is Bitcoin wings, and there are some other products as well, VIX, and you know. Uh, other sort of structures that that could do well, but from my standpoint, I, I I would feel like I was going against my duty to my firm fiduciaries. Et Got to bring this up is what you're saying. Yeah. This is a real. I mean, it it's makes sense, right? It's it's a non-government issued FX. That's how I think about it. You know, a lot of people, um, including our boss, think about it as digital gold, Absolutely. which plays the same kind of role. I mean, gold would. Presumably Gold do, will very do very well, well in that scenario. Yeah. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, Mike Novogratz always says that he goes to bed every night praying for sound financial stewardship of the economy. But, Absolutely. But so this question, of course, and this, but this question, it's. I mean, we don't want you know political operatives playing chicken with the U.S. debt, right? So um, I don't know. We're gonna have to wait and see. We will follow up on that debt. As we get closer, we've got mm-hmm. about a month, it seems, to watch this uh, play out either way. Um, but that's all for now. Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading, as always, my friend. Great to see you. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's go now to our guest, Dan Held. Um, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on Galaxy Brains. 
Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a long time coming. I appreciate it. And uh, so, Dan, I think uh, many people in our audience may know Dan. He's been in Bitcoin for a long time. Um, how long? When did you get into Bitcoin? Uh, you know, I created my Mt. Gox account in 2011. I actually went back to go figure out the exact timing. So Do you have a claim? Or were you out of there before? No, I, I mean, it's pretty fucking obvious that Mt. Gox was going to collapse. <laughs> I, people who got trapped in that, I'm like, how the hell did you not see that happening? Right. Because there, there was there's a couple... I, I got really frustrated about this because I emailed the Wall Street Journal and a couple other media publications and gave them all this data, and none of them published it. I actually talked to Paul Vini about this, <laughs> where I found the original email and I showed it to him again. And I'm like, look, I told you guys about this in July 2013, and I gave you everything on a platter, amongst other publications as well, Forbes, uh, Cashmere Hill. Yep. Okay, so for two reasons it was obvious. One, there was a on a Bitcoin talk, because that's where everyone was back in that day, that's the forums. Yeah. There was a like a 500 paginated, like 500 page thread of people having withdrawal issues. Right, that that many. The, yeah, it was it was so every that was, day. That hundreds. was a red flag. Giant, giant, <laughs> huge red flag. Yeah. And then there was a, a price delta, so a price difference between uh, Bitstamp and Gox. And the only way to explain it is that the you know the Gox Bitcoin were more expensive. It's because people had to buy Bitcoin to get their money out because the fiat wires weren't working. Yep. So those. Those were very clear warning signs. So I know I didn't get caught in that. That's thing. nice. So yeah. you, but that's 2011, dude. You had, um, to, you had to send money via Dawala. There's like a weird Dawala <laughs> intermediary, and it would take like three days to get there. So you yeah. just like put your money in, and you didn't really see it pop out the other side for like a week. Well, like the three... Magic the Gathering online exchange, <laughs> it wasn't built for it to be a high-powered financial yeah. market. <laughs> that's what Mt. Gox stands was for. It, it was what was it written in? Was it PHP or something? Yeah, yeah. It's like what you used to write like bulletin boards in in like 2003. Oh, the uh, the interview he had on the blue the blue ball Carpelles. Yeah, Carpelles or whatever. Yeah. yeah, he had that blue exercise ball and he did an interview <laughs> with Reuters on that. Oh man, man. I mean yeah. Carpelles was convicted for uh, convicted for fraud in France prior. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. So like this guy was like a, he was, yeah, he's an idiot. Yeah. Um. So that was 2011. Yeah. Um. So you were interested in in doing Bitcoin stuff. When did you professionally? You know, it's funny is that people used to say Bitcoins too. Bitcoins. Yeah. I, I still ever, sometimes do, that? but yeah, yeah. but um, <laughs> Bitcoins, it depends. But yes, yeah. Bitcoin stuff. When did you uh, start doing it? Um. Like yeah, full like, time, like professionally. Yeah. So I I worked at a small investment firm in Dallas, and then they relocated me to San Francisco. And while I was in San Francisco, I started to go to the Bitcoin meetups. Yep, yep. So this was uh, at 20 Mission. Um, I mean, at that time, there's only a dozen of us. This is January 2013. And it was <laughs> like Brian and Fred. There were dozens. Brian and Fred from Coinbase would go. Yeah. There's dozens of us. Dozens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian and Fred, um, Charlie Lee, Jed McCaleb, Jesse Powell. Yeah. I'm the fucking pleb non-billionaire of the group <laughs> so it, it was small it, it was literally a dozen people in a, like a cooler pbrs it was actually yeah. a bathtub with ice and PBRs. Literally. yeah it was, pbrs were all we could afford so that that was pretty and, and uh jared kenna was the guy who owned 20 mission he also built the first u.s exchange called trade hill this is so old no one remembers this stuff anymore <laughs> but uh that's that's the early community so i started to go to that i was wearing business like business cash coming from work basically coming from work <laughs> yeah and, and everyone else is in hoodies and shit yeah um so march 20 uh, march 2013 price went from ten dollars to 260 and that's when the, the fervor really happened yeah so we had 100 people come to the meetup um there's like 100 people there were vcs i mean i remember david chen from lightspeed partners like handing out business cards and i'm like whoa i'm three months in right. silicon valley Right, you know, I'm 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 like a noob. You got Lightspeed. I mean, that's a big fund. They've been around for for a long time. Yeah, they're big fund, and and things felt tangible. And then uh, around then is when I decided to build my first product. So, on mobile, when you try to check the price of Bitcoin, all the mobile apps at the time didn't have live prices for no technical reason. The engineers were just lazy; they didn't <laughs> want to ping the API and pull the price down. So, uh, we built the first real time market data product with news charts. Uh, kind of all-encompassing, so that was my first foray into product building. And it's called Zero Block, and it became the most popular mobile app in crypto in 2013. And we got bought by blockchain.com. Yep. And I was the first PM at blockchain.com back in December 2013. So that was uh, that was my foray into tech uh, and, and into crypto professionally was moving out to SF, building my first mobile product. The way I, the way I 
<clears throat> describe it, I think, most accurately is, accurately is I stumbled and bumbled my way into it. <laughs> I didn't know what product thinking was. Yeah. I just built a, a product I was obsessed about to solve my own problem. Yeah. And that turns out actually how you how you build great products. Yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you knew what you needed. You you were a user. Precisely. Um, I was that was the target audience. So you went to blockchain.com, which is obviously still around and a pretty big I mean pretty I would say relatively big player even today. Um, at one point, I, and this is definitely stale, but they had 25 million wallets. I mean, at some point, well, um, much yeah. later than that. <laughs> what, what did you do there? And then what, what was your whole? You know, yeah, blockchain what was next? Blockchain.com at the time was pretty hot. Yeah. Um, there's the whole like Abraham and Isaac story too, where like there was a divorce between, because originally it was Brian Armstrong and uh, the founder of blockchain.com, what's his name? Um, ben Reeves. They were originally supposed to work together. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole. This has actually been written up, I think, in Wired. Yeah, so. there might be also. Um, what was that book? Uh, somebody wrote a, a decent book about Coinbase. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but also has yeah. some, has some history like this in there about. I think about that split. Yeah, and, and the, you know, this is uh, blockchain.com was non-custodial, it's a web wallet, right? You know, so it was a pretty hot idea, a very popular wallet. A ton of people used blockchain.com back in the day. Yeah, uh, the Block Explorer as well. Right, blockchain.info, although yeah. you get there through .com. One of the biggest block explorers. Still, yeah, probably. Sti still. Um, and there was a lot we thought we could do with that, you know, to build like a dApp store, you know, decentralized apps on top of our, our web interface. Um, advertising, of course, was like an early, quick monetization path. Um, there was just a lot of bad execution and leadership, I think, that led to blockchain.com floundering. Because we, I mean... When is, the, when is the last time you, you've heard someone name drop, I have a blockchain.com wallet, or you've seen it, someone pull it open, or any any reference to a blockchain.com wallet? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to sustain, like, I mean, right, because then you have, like, Binance, FTX, or whatever. I mean, um, these big, giant new players constantly come in and disrupt. I feel there's yeah. very few. Coinbase maybe being, even, like, Bitstamp, right? Yeah. Been around, longest-running exchange, I think. Right. Um, you know, I mean, big, not, but not that big, right? It's always like these new guys keep coming in and disrupting. Yeah. I mean, if it, it's hard it, to sustain that, it's, it's super hard. I mean, the fact that like Kraken is still alive and, and thriving after this long is honestly, it's a race of survival. Yeah. It's like a, it's a marathon. Yeah. And whether like regulations kill you, com competition kills you, just surviving though alone is like a pretty hard thing to do. Yeah. Not getting hacked. Right. I mean, I mean, you're holding digital bearer assets. Like yeah. it's like the number one cybersecurity, like <laughs> honeypot. Like if we were to ask noobs, and we'd be like, "Hey, have, have you heard of Bitrex or Crips, Cripsy or Poloniex?" They'd be like, uh, I've never heard "Remember of it. Cryptopia? Um, Cryptopia, the one that was a like New Zealand one." Yeah, Poloniex yeah. was based in Boston. No one even knew they were there. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I almost um, uh, I, I did some interviews for a job there when I was trying to move full time into crypto before I I was at Fidelity before I did it at Fidelity. Um, and the, and I was like, yeah, well, you know, I, I I like the troll box on Polonix. Oh, like, the I troll used box to use is great. Uh, yeah. BTCE was my uh, my, <laughs> my most cherished Wasn't exchange. Wasn't the one that they shut down for like being a um, like, oh yeah like a Russian money I, laundering thing I, in, the, in the end? I loved BTCE. BTCE was wonderful. So <laughs> no KYC AML. It was broken English and Russian. <laughs> But they never, they never uh, rug pulled. Yeah, as far as far, no, they got yeah. taken down because, like, Interpol said but that there were terrorists on it's there. It's even or more something. epic than that, though. Yeah. So they ran for like seven years without getting taken down, and then they finally got taken down. When they got taken down, so like the FBI like worked with Interpol to like seize the server. Their private key management was so good that they just lost all the fiat. <laughs> so they popped up another website, and they're like, you can log in over here, and we have all your crypto. Oh, my gosh. So they had 70% of the funds were in crypto, and they're wow. like, yeah, you can withdraw it. Wow. So even when they got seized, they were they like— didn't actually get seized. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They were actually pretty, like, crypto OG ethos. Yeah, I like that. That's yeah. interesting. They, def there was definitely a front for, like, money laundering for Russia. Yeah, I mean, like you know, uh, as Bulgaria one does in early, like an early, like, you know, Central Caucasus region Bitcoin exchange or It whatever. was amazing, though. I mean, you email address, you go in, and the liquidity was real. Yeah, so the interface um, is terrible. <laughs> They're the ones who pioneered the troll box. That's where it came from. Uh, the troll box was a big part of like the pre seventeen and earlier uh, crypto trading world. Um, yeah, you got, like ri rise chicken, rise chicken rise. That's like an <laughs> Litecoin early mimetic thing. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the the moment in um, oh, what's it called? It's uh, Blade Runner. Yeah, you know, at the end where uh, Harrison Ford and the android are there. Yeah, and he laments how no one will ever remember see the things that he's seen. Those will all fade. Yep. That's how I feel with some of this stuff. It is 
it feels like ancient history. Um, yeah. And it, because I feel like when the big bull runs happen, the 17s, the 21s, like so many new people come in um, that it's just impossible to impart all of the oral tradition. Yeah, there's like, right? there's like uh, you've got these old narratives, right, from the previous epics. Yeah. And then you have these new narratives that just come in and the size of the community behind the narrative is so large that it just right. kind of like crushes the... It's so true. I mean, yeah. you even think about, you know, we talked with... Um, we talked about um, like the you know sound money laser eyes culture from like the last two plus yeah, years. That's eighteen nineteen era. Very different yeah. from like the sixteen seventeen and even before that. But yeah. I mean, very very different. But you know, right around the having, it particularly accelerated at the third having and COVID money printing. That was like a real inflection point for Bitcoin's sound money narrative. Yeah. And then you had, you know, what Pete Rizzo calls the monetary maximalist take over sort of the Bitcoin culture. There used to be the platform maximalist that said that, yeah. you know, everything should be a test net for Bitcoin. And if there's something good, we'll actually incorporate it to yes. the platform. But yeah, that that, a, that's, that's a common narrative. That's fallen by the wayside, I think, as a dominant form of Bitcoin culture. When right. they come back, inscriptions might be uh, moving some of that culture back. I do think so. I think I think Bitcoin DeFi... That Overton window has now been shifted. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, Because you've been talking about Bitcoin DeFi for a while. And by the way, you also had great content for a long time evaluating. Now, I know some people have given you crap about this because BlockFi ultimately like went out of business or whatever. But you had great content on um, how how to do uh, uh, lending and options types activity across the ecosystem where you would do, uh, you'd borrow or or, or you'd lend or you'd do like call overriding strategies or whatever you were doing. At a bunch of different vendors and exchanges, and and publish all the information. Yeah, and I mean, so, I, I was one of the first ones to call out like Celsius and stuff like that because I'm like, these seem super shady. Definitely wouldn't have your money there. As someone who used like all of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I checked them all out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got a lot of flack for that too because people were like, "Oh my god, you recommended these services," and I'm like, I had a spreadsheet with, and I had a spreadsheet that showed my exact coin holdings at each one. I mean, I lost ten Bitcoin at, at uh, Genesis, like. <laughs> Okay, like I didn't analyze the risk properly, but what other individual would write up this content and put their money where their mouth is, right? Other than myself. So, and that, I still got a ton of flack. Everyone was like, "Fuck you! You reckon you you had money at BlockFi at one point?" And I'm like, "I t- I said a year and a half before they went under to move all your money out of BlockFi, but they people will take screenshots from right. a 2019 tweet and be like, <laughs> you talked about BlockFi favorably in 2019.' I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like." You never read any of my other stuff where I'm like, yeah, my money's out of BlockFi or the sheet has zero for BlockFi right. for a year and a half. Right, yeah. And they're, that's where the maxis get really fucking annoying where they're like, and then they're like, oh, all lending is evil. I mean, that is absurd. This is a common narrative amongst the hardcore fundamentalist maxis now um, where they're like, all lending is evil and yield is evil and it's usury. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? This is called capitalism of people assessing risk and then allocating like an uh, uh, assigning an interest rate that compensates them for the risk that will always exist even in a bitcoin standard and there's this weird thing that's happened now where like it's a, a very very anti-capitalist anti-free markets tone where nfts are immoral and evil and scam somehow and i'm like okay who cares if people want to buy and sell art right what whatever like it, it really started with Safedeen. Um, creating this culture, um, just to call it out. I like his thoughts on a lot of other things, but the whole modern art thing, beca- that's that's where that came from. Yeah, it's in the Bitcoin standard. Is he- that, yeah, these things are fiat things, and fiat things are evil or moral, but he's assigning subjective, weird values to fiat things and immoral things. And if you want to be a free markets person, a capitalist, and you want to believe in Bitcoin, you have to be open to people buying and selling whatever they want. Otherwise, you're authoritarian. So it's a more authoritarian leaning, which is really bizarre. And this newer cohort of Bitcoiners, laser eye, you know, like fundamentalist types, which I don't think many Bitcoiners would actually, if you gave them a choice, they wouldn't actually be like, yeah, I'm for that. There's like a very loud minority. Um, it's pretty sad to see because I'm like, they're like, oh yeah, if you sell a course that's evil, if you buy or sell art that's evil, if you earn interest that's evil, and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Like, so, this it, is bizarre. It is a fundamentalist viewpoint, uh, sort of focused on sound money as the only thing that is sound. Look, I, I, my big narrative. I mean, you remember back in when we first met? I think back in 1819. Yeah. You know, I was hitting the, you know, hitting the bell of sound money. Right. And I still believe in the whole sound money thesis. Right? They're not really correlated with each other at all. Like, <laughs> you can be sound money and have, you know, like and have other stuff. Yeah. If Bitcoin's going to be the world reserve currency. 
it's going to have everything else on it, right? Like, right. It's not going to be this world of just pure Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> it's like the only thing you can yeah. do is hold Bitcoin. <laughs> right. I know. And, well, you're so, going to have to spend Bitcoin on education, <laughs> on uh, on artwork, on whatever, right. on on McDonald's. Yeah. Right. It, it's a it's a it's a cultural thing where people want to be in the in group, and so whatever the in group is is deciding as the end thing, everyone signals that they're into that thing. Well, that's, I think, you know, I think that's really accelerated in COVID. Everyone's at home, mm-hmm. um, literally. I mean, you're literally at home. The podcast circuit was humming. The money printer was burring. Um, the having occurred. There was plenty of good the, reason. The clubhousing. That we were you, on clubhouse. You were, you were a legend over I, there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I still do. Um, technically, I think I control the Bitcoin club on Clubhouse. How many followers does it this have? It has 500,000 followers, wow. which I think is, like no offense to Clubhouse, but I think that's like uh, two or three times the total number of Clubhouse <laughs> users at this point. Sure. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it, so it accelerated and we were all, and we weren't out and about. When you meet people in person, you're not going to, most people aren't toxic in person. No, no. But it, the internet culture, you know, the edge lord stuff, like the people are just much more likely to in group associate and then, you know, attack the out group at any. Point. Yeah. Yeah. And I've only been heckled once in person and it was a pretty minor thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't like when I was up on stage, it was just like in passing. Yeah. So I, and, 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 but I do think it, it, it feels yeah. like the tide is turning a little bit. It, it is fun with the internet trolls, though. <laughs> I always loved when I see them in person to give them a very warm embrace and like a very hard, firm handshake. Yeah. It's like a, a bear hug of, of cringe. I, it's it is funny too because if they yeah. don't come out and say what they said to you online, mm-hmm. that's you're winning right there. Most of them are super fucking beta. Like, <laughs> you know, you just come up to them and give them a warm hug, and they get like really fucking uncomfortable. It's wonderful. It's it's like the best. It's best a very disarming. It. Yeah, they, they can't reject it because they look like an asshole in person. Right. So they have to accept it, but you can tell they're dying from the cringe. <laughs> so you're just like, I just, I just revel in those moments. So it, the, but the culture is expanding. I think inscriptions have a yeah. big part in this. Um, there was another thing too. John Light's paper on um, roll-ups. On, on roll-ups on Bitcoin, yeah. I think got a lot of people interested um, in what more could be done, right? So almost a platform maximalist resurgence. Now, I wouldn't yeah. say it's it's not taking over Bitcoin culture, but it's bringing a lot of people, let alone just the straight up inscription movement is literally bringing in thousands and thousands of People that he, many of whom left Bitcoin for other chains because they wanted to do other stuff yeah. on other chains. Many people who've never been interested in Bitcoin at all. And inscriptions are bringing back inscriptions steal market share away from other chains. It brings them back to Bitcoin. These are more like ETH and, and Solana maximalists. Yeah, and now they're into Bitcoin, which is great. Bitcoiners should be jumping for joy with this. I noticed. So I, I'm writing a paper called Casino Games, which I haven't written something long form in a long time. Casino Games essentially says that you know all of adoption in crypto is primarily through speculation. And so Bitcoin, if you think about Bitcoin as a casino, it's got one game, spot trading, basically. And that speculative game is what draws most people in. This is completely obvious. We have 13, 17, 20, 21 as the cycles. Adoption occurs that way. Adoption did not occur because 100 Nigerians were paying for food with Bitcoin. Yep. You know, So like when we see that happen, we see these speculative loops draw in more and more users. These This is the natural user acquisition cycle for a money. The Bitcoin casino only has one game. Uh, the Ethereum casino has a bunch. Yield farming. Tons of games. Tons yeah. of games. Lots yeah. of games. Right. Now, Bitcoiners might dismiss that as, oh, well, that's just speculation. Well, uh, newsflash, that's how Bitcoin got adopted. People didn't buy Bitcoin because it sound money. Right. You, st- you come for the gain, for the, for the moon, and you stay for the sound money. Precisely. Yeah. That's what most people did. Right. Even... Even early on. Even part of us probably yeah, initially. Sure. Yeah, So Bitcoiners like to believe that Bitcoin is immune from this. The speculation is this dirty word. No, that's how Bitcoin got adopted. And that's how people are getting into Ethereum. Now, what I noticed at NFT NYC last year is that people were thinking in an Ethereum standard once they bought NFTs. They're like, yeah, man, I bought it for 0.1. He flipped it for 0.3. Right. Now, do they understand anything about Ethereum's monetary policy? No, they, they don't understand that at all. But if that speculative game introduced them to Ethereum and now they're holding Ethereum and thinking in Ethereum standard. They're Ethereans. They're Ethereans, and that's yeah. a decent way to introduce them to a money. Now, right. I don't think the Ethereum community understood this fundamentally at the beginning. They were just like, build stuff. Yeah. Stuff will happen. Right. They stumbled upon this via luck. Um, the Bitcoin community, I believe, needs to embrace it because speculation will lead to more people holding Bitcoin, which helps Bitcoin long term. So more speculative games are good for Bitcoin. That includes NFTs, 
other DeFi things. Now, some of these do have very like fundamental good use cases too. People want to sell digital assets, like digitally, digitally native assets that are non-fungible, NFTs. Those, I think, make a lot of sense on a blockchain. You'll have other things as well. Borrowing and lending your Bitcoin will be an inherent activity that a lot of people would want to do. Mm -hmm. So that will exist as well. Like these You'd are like not, to see that in yeah. something that is more DeFi than CFI because it's mm -hmm. much more transparent, right? I mean, there are risks, obviously, with like you know the Ethereum ecosystem, smart contract hacks and bugs and all that. Yeah, shit. I mean, let's, but, let's definitely not gloss over the risk of zero days. You know, like I think a lot of the DeFi side, totally, they're like, oh, we have no counterparty risk. I'm like, yeah, you fucked wad. Like, yeah. but you have a massive amount of zero day like protocol risk, and they're like. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, right. I'm no, like, they do. Hold on a second. But, like, but yeah. there, ha and I totally agree. I mean, yeah. it's an absolutely massive risk, and it's by, by the way, it's also one that's basically impossible for an average person to evaluate. Oh, yeah. So, and, oh, and, even and almost people. every one of the big hacks that has happened in Ethereum DeFi was all also the application went through a rigorous process. It really did by these security auditing firms, and still you don't know and you screw up. So there right. is risk. De but DeFi is our goal. Yeah, yeah because, no, exactly. Goal. Because yeah. if you look at what happened with the credit deleveraging in CFI. DeFi really performed, you know, blue chip DeFi, yeah. quote unquote, performed yeah, yeah. really well. Totally. Um, so that's, we, you know, we'd like to see, I guess. Um, but I, where does that happen? Does that happen on, can't happen L on the L1 right now, right? Where does it happen well, for Bitcoin? kind of. I mean, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, you can do DEXs, that's like ordinal true. DEXs on Bitcoin layer one. Yes. Yeah. I mean, DeFi is this all encompassing term for yeah. like, what does that mean? So Every, a DEX can be done, kind of. A DEX can be kind of done on Bitcoin L1. Yeah. So th there's, there's really cool things you can do with that. Um, you know, Bitcoin's inherent protocol design pushes a lot of that activity to L2. Right. So we'll probably see most of that happen, happen in L2s. I mean, you've got a bunch of L2s. We've, you've probably talked about them previously. Yeah. You've got, you know, Lightning, Rootstock, uh, Stacks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, Stacks is kind of like Arbitrum and, and uh, Poly, uh, Polygon, where they're like a L2 with a token. Yeah, it's like a Bitcoin adjacent. It's like it's yeah. like a Bitcoin adjacent uh, L2, as opposed to like a. I mean, if the uh, if the ma if the layer technology maximalists are listening, right, they would say, well, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's not technically an L2. No, it's not but, technically an L2, but it's because it doesn't of, derive its security directly from the L1. It kind of does, um, but though. it kind of does it, in a different it's like, way. It's like really fucking weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people get like freaked out by but it. But either way, and you also have side chains. You have Liquid. You yeah. have um, uh, is that it? <laughs> Rootstock is a side Root, chain. It is, yeah. Rootstock. But Rootstock also has a token. Most people forget that. Actually, it's actually interesting. Does. Yeah. So like, I, I think. Um, or you can pay for the gas fees in Bitcoin. That's very interesting. L, so LBTC, I think. Yeah. Or S. Yeah. One of the yeah they have their own RBTC. Maybe, RBT, yeah, RBTC. Yeah, RBTC. Yeah, it's RBTC. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so especially with the new crowd coming in, partly from inscriptions, a lot of these folks from Ethereum who like NFTs now they like Bitcoin inscriptions. Now they might say, well, wait a second, where do I do my 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 DeFi because I'm ETH when I yeah. buy in it, and and that's been really interesting because the 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 long term dominant maxi Bitcoin maxi culture hasn't been interested in doing DeFi right. So like RSK's rootstock's been around, right? Isn't it Sergio Lerner? Forever. It's been around forever. Yeah, been around forever. Um, and um, well, people forget that like NFTs started on Bitcoin, right? Rare Pepe's on Counterparty, but Bitcoiners just didn't, weren't that interested. I mean, they were a little well, interested. The newest newest cohort that are more fundamentalists that have all these stupid arbitrary things that they've assigned to Bitcoin, <laughs> but the old Bitcoiners, the OGs, myself, yeah, they enjoyed it. Yeah, of course. Did you do you have any rare Pepe's? I don't. I mind Prime Coin though. <laughs> so claim to fame. Yeah, I mind. I mind a whole block of Prime Coin. Nice. First day it came out. Um, Prime Coin was doing something. This is before I understood proof of work as well as I do now. Yeah. But I was like, oh, it's doing something useful. It's yeah. Finding prime numbers. Yeah. Right. It's silly, but uh, uh, I yeah. did like that idea though. Um, prime numbers are a fascinating topic. We won't get into anymore because I know we're short on time. But um, you know, what do you what do you uh, see in the future? What are you doing now? You were at Kraken for a yeah. long time, obviously. Um, and um, but you're not at crack anymore. What are you doing now? And, and what do you think for the next, yeah. you know, the near medium term? What does Bitcoin look like for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, left Kraken after three years there. Kraken's a great company. Love the team. Yeah, love, love the leadership. Um, left there, wanted to. You know, I've done quite a few things almost in over a decade. I'm, I'm an old. I'm an old man <laughs> in crypto in crypto years. So, Block Explorer, Web Wallet, mobile price tracker app. Tax software, micropayments. I remember the tax software. I forgot about. Yeah, interchange. The interchange. <laughs> I forgot about that. I know. And you and um, you and Matt, right? Uh, yeah, Matt Galligan. Yeah, that yeah. was that was it. And Clark I, Moody. That's when we talked with you uh, when I was back at Avon. We yeah. Were gonna, and then and then it was like um, there was an acquisition, right, or something like that. We got that. bought by Kraken. Right, and that's how you ended up at Kraken. That's right. Got yeah. It. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, Kraken exchange brokerage. Right. 
um, options. You know, they got, they got all sorts of stuff. OTC yeah. Desk. So I've kind of touched on a lot of different products in the space. And so the DeFi world is something I haven't touched on as much. Um, that's where Trust Machines is building a suite of applications on top of Bitcoin, kind of like a consensus for Bitcoin, yep. the Ethereum consensus. Yep. So they raised $150 million. They've got an exceptional team. So I came in and helped them build out their marketing team. So I helped them build out the marketing team, strategy, execution. So I'm, I'm sort of like the fractional VP of marketing over there. Got it. Um, that's super fun. Love the team. We just had an event last night you were at. Yeah, yeah, I did. It was at the great, great pub key. The pub key. 85 yeah. Washington Place, my favorite bar in New York. Yep. That was that was super fun. Um, it's a great team. We've got a couple different products that we're building. And then as well, I do other fractional VP of marketing work. Um, another one is the Wizards. Tap so, Wizards. Yeah, this isn't super well known yet, but I'm starting to tell more people I'm working on the Wizards project. I, so, I really have to say I like the Wizard projects where we had Udi Wertheimer on the podcast. I, I, I was just drawn into it. Well, like, I just it was, it you was know, hard to hard people, to resist. A lot of people are critical of Udi. They think he's some kind of anti Bitcoiner at this point. It's just not true. Like I've talked to him a lot, and like it's look at the Tapper Wizards project. You know how you how you interact with, and they haven't ex- expressly said that how an airdrop or something might one day happen because they've minted all the Wizards. Yep, but they they're not haven't been distributed. They're not for sale yet. But you have to complete the wizard quests, and what 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 are those? I mean, aside from the yeah. funny shower, yeah, that they, was you you. We wanted that. It's as all a, Bitcoin activity. It was a way to have a fair standard for whitelisting. Normally, whitelists are a bunch of insider sort of like yeah, or at best, it's like you clicked the form first, right? I mean, it's just, exactly yeah. You heard this of is, it. Early. This is proof of work. It is. You had to get in the shower and take a take a shower. <laughs> it's pretty. Awkward. But also complete a lightning transaction, I mean, I, a bunch of other yeah. Bitcoin specific oh, yeah. we, stuff. We, we had to don- you had to donate to HRF. So you're teaching people how to use Bitcoin. You had to donate mm-hmm. Bitcoin to the Human Rights Foundation using Lightning. Yes, you're yeah. teaching people how to use Bitcoin. So I just don't know how people can really be that critical of this. I know. And, and by the way, most of the, the smart people I know are not critical of it. To right. be clear, right. because it's awesome. And the Wizards go back to an early 2013 meme, the the R Bitcoin subreddit. Bring it back. Yeah, because it was the forums and the subreddit and then Twitter. Yeah. Twitter wasn't really a thing. Like Bitcoin Twitter was like a thing. twenty fifteen or so. It was it was a lot. Yeah, it was late. I mean, yeah, it was. Um, and even now, I don't know. We'll, we'll, that's we'll save this for a different conversation. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, it, I, I think I think Udi, you know, he likes to poke the bear a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, yeah. So. I mean, he's a troll by by nature, yeah. like as a human. It's not yeah. an act. He is that way. Yeah, he is that <laughs> way. Um, you know, him and Eric are are the two main guys behind the project. Right. Um, and they're both a little trolly like that. I think I think their their roles are very important in crypto for Bitcoin and Ethereum communities, because they'll poke both sides. Oh, yeah. And I think they do a good job of doing that, because you need someone to kind of challenge the status quo. I think Udi, um, a lot of like Bitcoiners don't like him just because he brings up uncomfortable conversations that they don't want to have. Um, and I think he revels a little too much in the poking the bear thing. So he, he gets a lot of heat, but he creates the heat that he gets. Yeah. Um, Wizards, I think, are really, I think they're going to be the punks or apes of Bitcoin. It's memetically the most cogent, I think, project in the space because it ties back to this original meme. It's just fun. It's yeah, just, it's, it's hard to describe it. It's it's super silly. Um, I agree. You know, we're, we're having an event tomorrow. And, in uh, New York, yeah. Yeah, and so I was working with them. I'm like, how silly could we make a certain thing? Like whether it be uh, lighting setup or something else. We're like, we're like, actually, if we did it shittier, It'd be funnier because <laughs> if we do it too well, it looks too polished. Yeah, and that's not what we're about. It's just the the, the wizard itself. For those who haven't seen right, it, it's, is, it's like clunky. It's like it's an MS, MS Paint sort of drawing. Yeah. I I do yeah. like by the way. There's two uh, two thousand one hundred twenty one of that's them. That's right. Twenty one twenty one. They're and beautiful. The, yeah. The, well, the, the once you start getting out of like the original ones that look really like kind of iconic classic, like for that meme, um, the sort of generative, like the the different colors and stuff, it's it's actually pretty yeah. funny and pretty pretty cool. Like, the PFP ones are super cool. That's what I mean. Yeah. They, they, we started to add texture to them. The, like the Arthur Hayes one is actually my favorite. Yeah. Arthur Hayes has a badass one. It's like gold. I've seen it. He's uh, on his uh, on the ski slope with a yeah. coconut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's 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 very very mimetic. Um, Dan, thank you so much for joining. Dan Held, uh, great to have you on Galaxy Brains, and we'll, we'll check in with you again in the future. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's episode of Galaxy Brains. Thank you to our audience for listening, and thank you to Bimnet Abibi and Dan Held, our guests, for a great show. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email. Read our content at galaxy.com research. And follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.